How do I stop nations from being birthed? This gun in my hand. Remember that. A spat is just a spat. Welcome to You Must Remember That, a radio program dedicated to uncovering the secret and or forgotten history of Hollywood's first three decades. I'm your host, Karina Longfellow. We are wrapping up our series on the Racy Teens, silent films made between 1910 and 1919. I had hoped to cover the filmic career of Lillian Gish from her starring turns in silent movies The Musketeers of Pig Alley to The Battle of the Sexes, Daphne and the Pirate, and ending that decade with Broken Blossoms, not forgetting her work in Birth of a Nation. However, Miss Gish was unable to arrange time for an interview, so I booked the leading male star of Birth of a Nation, Henry B. Walthall. When he fell through, I tried Elmer Clifton, Spottiswood Aitken, and Elmo Lincoln. As none of these were available, I have with me in the studio Mr. Papo Threadgill. You must remember Mr. Threadgill from recent films such as Unhand Me, You Beast, Ain't That a Kick in the Union Suit Flap, as well as The Loves and Lives of Meemaw Hutchins, No I Shan't, and Wink and Tickle Lassie. Mr. Threadgill, call me Papo! No. Mr. Threadgill, tell us about your involvement in what is now recognized as the first 12 real dramatic feature film, The Birth of a Nation. Oh, I played a ruffian in blackface. Tell us more. Not much to it. I threw a rock through the stained glass window of a church and yelled, Gosh, now! But then I ran off camera and someone else set fire to it. The church, not the camera. Amazing. We have that part queued up. Let's listen. Yes, now when I turned to the camera and shouted those words, Gosh, now! They inserted a title card of what I had said. Not everyone got that. Sometimes you'd flap your lips for half a minute and the camera would wander on to something else. Nothing on screen spelling out what you said. But I got paid two extra dollars because of that title card. How did you feel about the film when it was complete? The public's reaction to it or the fact that it was screened in the White House? Oh, that was nice. And do you have any stories about Lillian Gish? Things she did on the set or how you felt about her performance? She was good. I never met her. I tried to ask her a question once and someone socked me in the eye as I approached her. Because I was still in blackface, see? Very convincing makeup artists on that one. They whisked her away and I never got the change. Do you remember your co-stars? Elmo Lincoln or Henry B. Walthall or Elmer Clifton? Uh, no. Which one was this? I've been told I was in the Battle of Elderbush Gulch, standing behind Elmo, but I don't remember it. It didn't look like me when I saw it. We were talking about Birth of a Nation. Some people have said that times have changed, that you couldn't make Birth of a Nation today. No, you could. Everything's the same. There's a lot of love for that film and for the movement it spawned. In fact, some studio is talking about remaking it. Really? You know how they do. They'll get a few big-name stars, better costumes, taller crosses to burn. But then Hollywood is all talk, especially about what's in development. For all we know, it might not come out until the year of our Lord, 2016. Tell us about intolerance. I'm against it. I always try to be tolerant, except for some things. You know, sometimes you got to put your foot down. I mean the film Intolerance from 1916. You appeared in that with Lillian Gish and several of the revolving troupe of actors that D.W. Griffith cast in his films such as Miriam Cooper, Spottiswood Aitken. Oh, yes. I think I was in that one. They let me be on camera without blackface that time. 
We'll explore all of this and more on this episode of You Must Remember That. Join us, won't you? I'm right here. Are we not recording? We'll be back after this message. This gun in my hand is brought to you by Lurfree's Cork. Have you tried burning the end of a cork that was still moist with residue from the wine or whatever it had been used to stop up, or found the soot from a burnt cork to be too dry, such that it falls off in the middle of your performance? Why not try Lurfree's Cork today? Carved by hand for professionals by professionals, so the powder is just right. As you may know, all commercially available cork grows around the Mediterranean basin. You might think that southern folks are best at distributing cork for minstrel shows, but that's plainly not true. People in Dixie mistreat their cork. In the northern United States and the Midwest, we know how to treat cork right, making sure it stays where it belongs. With Lurfree's cork, you know they'll laugh when you mean them to laugh, and cry when you mean them to cry. Blacken your eyes today, the Lurfree's way. It's a real corker. We now return to You Must Remember That, with your host, Karina Longshoreman. Mr. Threadgill... Lillian Gish must have been so breathtaking in person, just to be in her presence. How did you resist the allure of Lillian Gish? The what now? Miss Longfellow, I need your help. Falk Zilgian? Who? Miss Langfellon, I have reason to believe someone up to no good has erased my memory of the last six to twelve hours. I probably learned someone's secret identity or their nefarious plans during that period. Why would they bother to erase my memory otherwise? I don't know. So I'm hoping your power will help. I need the hypnotic suggestion you implant in people's minds to retrieve their lost and or forgotten histories. Please tell me the name of your show, You Must Remember This, is more than just a title. The show is entitled, You Must Remember That. See, I can't even remember the title of the show correctly. You gotta help. I'm not sure where you got this notion. I have no special powers. Half the time I interview people, they don't remember enough to put together into a coherent show. I'm obliged to air them anyway. And in my opinion, the results are darn fine shows, Miss Langtree. Can you think of anyone who might have that power? If we can find someone who can restore memory, it could be advantageous for you too. You could seek their help when interviewing forgetful guests. No offense. I'm barely paying attention, so none taken. Well, I'm no expert, but I read the papers. Judging by the names they've taken... You might ask Brainstorm, or Brainclaw, or Skullduggery, Mindbender. Those are all villains. The Headmaster, Head Cheese, Head Honcho. There's that guy with the giant head who hovers in some kind of futuristic suit of armor. Uh, I forget what the acronym is, but it spells out Modicum. Mental organism designed to increase common usage of murder. Those are all villains. They'd just as soon kill me as look at me. Perhaps you could pit one of them against another. Make it a challenge. Ask them, which of you would be superior at restoring my memory? Well, the problem is, it might have been one of them who did this to me. I hadn't thought of that. Maybe it's like lost keys. The best way to find them is to retrace your steps. Was there someone in particular you were investigating before this gap in your memory? Well, I was just wrapping up the Penguin Pool murder case. I hadn't slept in two or three days. It was five in the morning. I was way out near Parabellum Heights, so I took the bus downtown towards my headquarters. The next thing I remember, it was five in the afternoon. And where were you when your memory returned? I was on the bus again. Whatever happened when I reached my secret headquarters that morning, someone must have attacked me there and wiped my memory. Or maybe I got word of a new crime to investigate and I left to pursue that, resulting in some criminal erasing my memory. Either way, they must have dragged me back onto the bus just to add to my confusion. Was it a different bus? No, bus number 17. I mean, was it the same route you had been on that morning? Yes, it runs from Parabellum Heights down to Quinder, east on Mechanic to Verf Street. Isn't that kind of a coincidence that they put you back on the same bus? I guess. Pizzicato isn't that big, though. They only have a handful of buses and routes. What's Pizzicato? Oh, it hasn't really caught on. That's the new name for the Parabellum City Area Transit System. They were trying to sell pizza and other freshly made items in the back of the buses, like an automat on wheels. It didn't pan out. Uh, pizza is sort of an Italian flatbread. With... I've heard of pizza before. It's kind of new to Parabellum City. I've only tried it a few times. It's not bad for bus food. So you're exhausted. It's five in the morning. You're riding the bus home to sleep. To my headquarters, yes. 
and then there's a 12-hour gap in your memory, and the next thing you remember is being on the same bus. That's it. You fell asleep on the bus. What? No. You fell asleep. The bus driver doesn't mind bums who ride the bus for hours just to stay warm, or students playing hooky who ride around the same route all day. Why would a student do that? There must be more interesting places to go or things to do than ride on a bus. I don't know, but I've heard it happens. You rode around the same route for 12 hours and woke up feeling anxious, because being a vigilante with a hundred criminals swearing to kill you would make anybody anxious. I don't think that's it. Although there was a sort of fleeting image I had during that gap in my memories. I was in seventh grade, Mrs. Crouch started handing out a test, and I realized I didn't have a pencil. I started patting my hips and chest to feel for a pencil in my pockets. Then I realized I was naked. And I wasn't 13, I was a full-grown man sitting in one of those little chairs with the integrated desktop. The kids started laughing at me. Mrs. Crouch asked how I expected to complete my test without a writing utensil, and I said, With this gun in my hand! You were dreaming, because you were asleep. I figured that was a fragment of a real memory that had been distorted by the process of erasing it. And then I was on the bus and it was 5 o'clock. I wiped the little crusty bits from the inside corners of my eyes. Say, maybe I was asleep. Can I get on with my interview now, Mr. Ziljian? See, it worked. You didn't even know you had that power. I'll let you get back to trying it on your guest. He's asleep, Mr. Threadgill. Papo, join us, won't you? No. You must remember that episode 86 of This Gun in My Hand was enunciated by Rob Northrup. This episode and all others are available on YouTube with automatically generated closed captions of dialogue. Visit thisgunninmyhand.blogspot.com for credits, show notes, archives, information on how to subscribe, and to buy my books, such as Little Heist in the Big Woods and Other Revisionist Atrocities. What's the last thing I remember? This Gun in My Hand. You must remember that a spat is just a spat. My love for you knows no bounds. Stop being such an utter clown as time falls down.